Hey everybody. Okay, let me just. Uh, why don't Why don't you uh, introduce yourself so I can adjust your your microphone volumes in real time? Sure. Do you want to go first, Nico? Yeah. Uh, my name is Nico House. I am uh, the former or the founder of Carolina Tunis for Bernie Sanders, which is the largest Bernie Sanders organization in the country. Uh, also, the former uh, state director for Bernie Sanders campaign, North Carolina was also the founder of the DNC fraud lawsuit and uh, Tulsi, one of Tulsi's 2020 surrogates. All right, uh, thank you for your service in 2016. Uh, so my uh, name is Ben Burgess. I am um, a columnist for Jacobin. I'm a philosophy instructor at Georgia State University Perimeter College. Uh, and I'm the host of a podcast called Give Them an Argument. Um, I. I know that I look a little funny right now because I'm about a foot lower towards the ground than I usually am, uh, and I hope the uh, the I hope the voice is okay since I've been having tons of back pain for the last week. So I brought a different chair up here, uh, and and I've been uh, and I'm sitting a little further away from uh, from the mic than I usually am. But uh, but uh, I really trying to get, force myself not to lean into the microphone, so I set the back support. But I hope this is okay. Yeah, it all sounds great. Um, okay, so I'll give a quick introduction. We are going to be talking about the topic, should the left support Joe Biden, specifically in swing states? And uh, both uh, of you are taking opposite stances on this topic. What it's gonna, uh, How we're going to go is we're going to do five-minute uh, opening statements, and you can obviously tell me at any point if you want to forego the rest of your time. We'll do a 20-minute uh, uh, open back and forth between the two of you. Uh, you're both uh, professionals in your... Uh, arenas, so I don't think I, I will need to do any moderating, but if things get a little too uh, spicy, I might uh, just try and redirect things back uh, to the topics at hand. Um, but otherwise, after that, we'll, we'll leave it open to some questions from the audience uh, that can be directed to either of you. And then uh, we'll close with five minute closing statements. Does that sound fair? Sounds great. Sure. All right. Um, so Ben, you proposed this debate, so I was thinking maybe you could open that way Nico can have the final word at the very end. Mm -hmm. That works for me. Okay. All right. Well, okay. We, will, we will start with five minutes on the clock now. All right. Uh, so first, I want to be clear about what I'm not arguing here. I'm not a progressive for Biden guy. I'm not going to tell you some story that soft pedals how, how bad Biden is in a, well, he's not perfect, but sort of way. I'm a socialist. Uh, the telos of my politics is organizing the working class majority of society first to achieve important reforms like Medicare for All and Green New Deal, and long-term to uh, reorganize uh, society in a radically more democratic way by extending democracy to the workplace. Uh, and I'm very well aware that Joe Biden is, like Donald Trump, a representative of the ruling class uh, that we are fighting against in those efforts. He's not a imperfect uh, friend. Uh, he is an enemy. Uh, the political agenda that I support isn't on the ballot. That was Bernie Sanders, tried very hard to get him nominated. Uh, we lost. Um, so we don't have that option of, of, the, uh, of the agenda that we support uh, being at least a realistic possibility to get more than a couple percent of the vote. Uh, what we have instead, and at least if we care about the outcome and not just making a statement, is a choice between two enemies. But here's the thing, even though Trump and Biden are both enemies, they're both representatives of the ruling class, they embody very different strategies for managing the system on behalf of that ruling class. And those differences matter. They don't just even matter in terms of harm reduction, they matter strategically. Um, so we can and should make a rational choice about which enemy we want to spend the next four years fighting and about which issues. I'm not pessimistic enough to believe that if Trump is reelected, uh, Jacobin and the Surf's Twitch channel are going to be shut down, we'll all be sent to concentration camps. I'm not optimistic enough to believe that Biden can be pressured to support import, you know, important reforms. Uh, I don't think either of those things are going to happen. But um, getting rid, even though I don't think that getting rid of uh, Trump by electing Biden is going to be any sort of step in the direction of American social democracy, what I think it absolutely is, is a necessary defensive maneuver to protect what little working class organization currently exists while we regroup and build the kind of political alternative that we so desperately need. Uh, some people might think that we can build that alternative by voting third party uh, in elections like this one, but we know that's not how it works. 
No electorally viable third party in any country with a system remotely like the United States has ever come about via any process like Jill Stein's 2%, becoming Holly Hawkins' 3%, becoming, 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 until finally some future uh, third party candidate wins an election. That's not how it works. If we ever are lucky enough to get an electorally viable third party in the United States, it's going to come about the way that Abraham Lincoln's Republican Party emerged from the decomposition of the Whigs. Uh, the anti-slavery wing of that becoming the Republicans by some organic process coming out of one of the existing parties. That's not going to come about by a third party. Uh, so what we have to think about is how we can build the kind of movement that could either, depending on how you see the end game of this, take over the Democrats, whatever that means, or by that kind of dirty break scenario, become a new party. Either way, I think that's building up the kind of electoral forces that coalesced around Bernie Sanders. And crucially, I think it's rebuilding the labor movement. I know I'm almost out of time here, but just let me make this last point really quickly. Uh, because without an organized working class at its base, left politics is just shouting into the wind. And Donald Trump is an existential threat to what little still remains of organized labor in the United States. Look at the differences between Obama's appointees to the National Labor Relations Board and Trump's. Trump's are on a crusade to stamp out what collective bargaining exists in American workplaces. I think if we're going to have a chance of regrouping and going forward, creating something new, creating something that could actually politically defeat centrists, it is vitally important that we have as much working class organization uh, as we possibly can uh, which is why I think that the enemy we want to spend the next four years fighting is the one that might try to co-opt and undermine the organized working class in various ways, but isn't just going to try to flat out stamp out what unions still exist in the way uh, that uh, that Trump's appointees to the courts and the NLRB have been and will continue to do. Uh, so I like Howie Hawkins. I admire him. I wish he could actually be president. And if I lived in California, uh, then I would, with a song in my heart, I would do the political equivalent of smearing some shit on my prison cell walls uh, by uh, by voting for him, by making that statement. But uh, because I don't, because I live in Michigan, I've done what I would urge other people to do, which is to make a reasonable strategic choice about which enemy you want to face. All right, Nico, on to you. Five minutes. Um, so even though I agree with you about, you know, the, the, the way that we progress in this country is by organized labor, but the key that you brought up is the ability to fight the enemy that we choose. Um, and the difference between Donald Trump and Biden is actually being allowed to fight the enemy. And that is what we're not going to get if we get Joe Biden. And I mean, even as we speak leftists are giving up leverage every single day. The article com comes out that Joe Biden is literally interviewing neocons for his administration, despite the task force that he created uh, whenever Bernie dropped out that everybody was so excited about. And yet myself and a few others were like, I don't know why you're excited about this. We're not going to get into the administration. And that's exactly what's showing up. Bernie Sanders has not been interviewed. AOC has not been interviewed. A lot of Mar, Pramila Jayapal, all the like have not been interviewed, and yet this seems to have fallen on deaf ears and people pretend like they haven't seen what they've seen with their own eyes. And on the, on, on the cusp of that news that we receive, AOC does a record-breaking get-out-the-vote effort in order to not, uh, get a rapist, segregationist, warmonger, sex pest elected with literally zero leverage. And despite Biden and the Democrats really having everything to lose, they still refuse to give you anything. And then, of course, it goes to what we're allowed to discuss, because if you bring this up, then you're immediately attacked by the left. I mean, not to mention being attacked by neoliberals, but immediately being attacked by the left. If you're Chris Pratt, for example, just by not going to a Joe Biden, Kamala Harris fundraiser, you're immediately labeled a white supremacist, despite his clear history of almost exclusively donating to Democrats like almost exclusively. And yet now he's a white supremacist because he wouldn't attend a Joe Biden fundraiser. Uh, when you're talking about Libya, because we're talking about, oh, we would rather have somebody co-op, right? How about the first black president who happened to be African being the reason that there is literal slave labor in Libya now, open market slavery in Libya under him, which barely anyone knows about because it was Obama or the fact that 
A young woman got her eyes shot out at Standing Rock. Another young woman got her arm shot off at Standing Rock. How about the fact that Occupy was undermined and destroyed and really never re allowed to be resurrected under Obama or the fusion centers where the intelligence community works with local governments to illegally spy on protesters. When we have eight to 10 protesters either missing or dead from Ferguson, which also happened under Obama, but nobody knows about it. Once again, it comes back to what we're allowed to, or who we're allowed to fight. Uh, and when we're seeing the censorship at the level that we are seeing it, where Twitter is not banning the information from the New York Post uh, about Hunter and Joe Biden's corruption in the Ukraine because it's they found that it's there's proof 100% that it is false information, but because at the time they didn't have 100% proof that it wasn't false, then you are heading towards a very slippery slope. And I may not like Trump, but the difference between Trump and Obama in this particular case is I'm allowed to critique Trump. I, I'm allowed to criticize Trump, and I may even be elevated for it. But if you criticize Biden, just criticize him then you could be banned off of a social media platform. And so you're talking about someone who has the entire neoliberal establishment, the neoconservative establishment with people like uh, uh, the Lincoln Project and the Transitional Integrity Project behind him. He's at, at a time where we're screaming, uh, defund the police, he says, well, actually, instead, should we nominate a cop and then give them more money? At a time where progressives and, and, and anybody really who even says, I agree with the Republican, is being smeared and hung and lynched damn near on social media. He's vetting the worst neocons that I can remember since I've been, been alive. Because he knows he can get away with it. And people like Ben and others will vote for him anyway. And then pretend as if there's any way that we can substantively move him when he has shown that not only can we not substantively move him to the left if he uh, if he if he wins, but even with all all of it on the line as we speak, he still will, he, not only will he not move to the left, he'll move to the right. He's moving to the right. I will not ban fracking. Biden's words. I will not. Uh, um, I'm my plan is not the Green New Deal. Biden's words. I don't feel bad for the 94 crime bill. It was actually just the state's fault, even though the bill, if you read it, clearly put the onus on the states to do whatever they can to put people in jail to get people paid. That's that is Joe Biden. Joe Biden five minutes. I, five minutes. OK, go ahead. Go ahead. OK, so I'm just going to open it up now. Maybe give Ben um, a, a minute or two just to respond to maybe a couple of those. But then it's going to be just open for him. The two of you can go back and forth. And yeah, as, as long as things don't just uh, turn into a screaming match, I don't think I'll need to to jump in at all. So, uh, you know, have at it, gentlemen. Go ahead, ben. Sure. So um, so I agree as far as the criticisms of Biden go um, and the criticisms Twitter go. I think I agree with just about everything uh, that that I heard. Right, I, I think that in the first couple sentences of uh, of my opening, I think I made it clear that that I agree uh, with all of that. So I think the question is, where do we come apart on this? And I think it's on two issues. Right, one of them is the criticism uh, issue that you were talking about, uh, the the degree of tolerance by the neoliberal and neoconservative establishments. Uh, for uh, for criticizing whoever is in is in office, and the other one is uh, is the leverage issue. So just to take those really quickly one at a time, I think uh, I think it's true, right? I don't, I absolutely do not believe. I think I said this in the opening statement uh, that uh, that Biden can uh, can be pushed uh, to the left. So I think that to to my mind. The whole leverage thing is almost a non sequitur. That uh, that yeah, I think that if we vote for Biden, uh, if we vote for Biden in swing states, which is where our votes matter the most, uh, then uh, then I don't think that we have any leverage over him. But I also don't think that withholding those votes uh, is uh, is a good way to get leverage. I think we've tried that strategy before and it didn't work. Uh, millions of people voted for uh, for Ralph Nader in two, in uh, in the year two thousand, including you know. Many times the well alleged gap between uh, Gore and Bush in the state of Florida, uh, and not only did that not lead to the Democrats saying, "Ooh, we lost some votes to our left," uh, then you know we better uh, you know we better move to the left next time. Next time they dominated John Kerry and and Joe Lieberman. Uh, there were several states in 2016 where the style the, the Jill Stein vote was bigger 
than the gap between uh, between Trump and Biden. Certainly, Michigan, uh, where uh, where I live, where uh, Biden, uh, we're sorry, where uh, where Trump beat Clinton by 0.23 percent of the vote. Uh, but not only did that not lead to the Democrats uh, moving left, we got uh, the most right wing major candidate in the uh, in the Democratic uh, in the Democratic primary. Uh, so I think the idea that uh, that you know, a couple percentage points of leftists withholding their votes is going to be some sort of way of exercising leverage. So if we don't do that, we're giving up leverage. I just don't know what that's empirically based on. I don't think we're going to have leverage one way or the other. I think that our strategy can't be about thinking about, okay, how is it that we're going to we're going to pressure centrist Democrats into becoming leftists? Because I think that's just not going to happen. Our strategy uh, should uh, should be about uh, about how can we build up something better, and is it going? Are we going to have an easier time if we still have some public sector unions, for example, still existing uh, in four years or eight years, uh, or if that's uh, or if that's not the case? I also really want to get into this issue about room to criticize, uh, but uh, we are in the open back and forth that I've been talking for a while. So, uh, so why don't I put it over to Nico? So it, but it, so what it seems to me is that you're advocating for like everybody give up your integrity, even though you have zero room or ability to change anything Biden is doing, which in and of itself is a, kind of a weird argument. But um, I would say that th this I guess the problem because I agree largely with what you're saying, but. The problem is, is that we're having a debate right now about whether or not to vote with Biden instead of us having a conference call right now on how to organize to shore up election integrity, because that's a major issue, which, by the way, all just all of a sudden became an issue because during the entire Democratic primaries, we saw exit poll after exit poll after ballots being uh, wrong ballots being given out after uh, voter suppression in p communities of color and young communities like no one wanted to acknowledge the realities of election fraud. But now that one party can use it against the other or vice versa, everyone wants to pretend like they acknowledge it. But yet we're not having any serious conversations about election fraud. That's something that we could be doing instead of voting for Biden or giving away our leverage. We could be I mean, and also, of course, making sure we never get to the point where we have a Joe Biden versus a Donald Trump. That's a major reason that we have these two is because we refuse to address election fraud. Uh, when we have ballot, or we, when we could introduce and work on introduce, introducing and organizing for ballot initiatives in different states where you can get ranked choice voting, open source blockchain software, et cetera, et cetera. Um, uh, Florida, you know, they, they organized to allow felons to vote. Uh, this is prior, this is in 2018. Um, like. Though that type of organizing is where all of our energy should be right now, if you consider yourself a progressive or a populist leftist. But instead, once again, we're having a debate about whether or not we should be voting for Biden in swing states, even though you yourself seems to concede that you agree it doesn't matter. Like, that's basically no. what you're telling me outside no, that's of- That's not all what I'm telling you. <laughs> well, um, well, that's what, but that's, but I mean, other than you're like, oh, well, if, union, if, if Trump breaks down, unions have been consistently breaking down. And this is, bef I mean, before Obama, I'm not gonna blame it all on Obama. And Clinton, I mean, obviously through Reagan, then Bush, then Clinton, then uh, Obama. And now it's just a continuation of what we have seen. So there's, but there's, unions, there's, there's, unions to this point are so weak now that we're literally in the middle of a pandemic. And they're, I mean, in, in the, the little bit of strength they have is nowhere near enough to get us anything that like is meaningful for the labor force as it is. So why not spend so, our time and energy organizing for that instead of pretending as if this election is going to yield some tangible gains for the working class in this country? Okay, first of all, I don't think it's going to yield gains. I don't think that's on the ballot. I think I think what it can do though uh, is preserve some of what's little what little is left of uh, of what's of what's been gained before against really unprecedented assaults now it's absolutely true the union movement has been declining for decades and decades no doubt about that but that doesn't mean that the differences between the kinds of rulings that Obama's National Labor Relations Board were making and the kind of ruling that's that Trump's National Labor Relations Board are making uh, don't matter. There's a reason. There was a New York Times article about this last week about uh, Trump cabinet members racing in advance of January 20th when they think their guy is probably going to be out of office uh, to make all, all sorts of regulatory changes. And the kinds of regulatory changes they're trying to make are all things like uh, making it easier to reclassify workers as independent contractors uh, so so you don't have to bargain with them. In many ways, there's a really good article about this by Paul Prescott and Jacobin. I would encourage everybody to check out in many ways uh, that 
Trump's NLRB uh, has turned back the clock on labor law to the most anti-worker it's been since the 1930s. And I don't think we should say, well, we've been losing the war anyway, so it doesn't matter if these really disturbing new things are happening uh, to uh, to roll it back that will be a difference. That is something we have control over. Unfortunately, the left doesn't have any control uh, over election integrity. You can do things like, you know, volunteer for uh, for poll monitoring groups. How do we not but have for the, but, but, for, but for the But for the next two weeks, right, there's not a lot we can do uh, that's, uh, that's going to do that. Now, what little we can do, like I said, you know, volunteering for those election protection sorts of efforts, I absolutely think, sure, we can do that. I think we could also walk and chew bubble gum, right? You can also spend five minutes filling out a ballot, uh, which there are other things there uh, that you probably want to do anyway in terms of, uh, of ballot resolutions, et cetera. Uh, mm. And while you're doing it at the top of the ballot, uh, make this defensive maneuver to stop Trump's appointees to the National Labor Relations Board from ravaging what's left uh, of organized labor. I think you can do that and also focus on these election integrity issues. And I just I just do want to go back to one of the first things you said in this part, right, which is you talked about uh, we're being asked to earlier, you said that, you know, we're being asked to, to sacrifice our leverage. Uh, but then it seemed like you agreed that we really don't have very much leverage either way. Uh, then you said we're being asked to sacrifice our, our integrity. I just want to make clear, those are two very different arguments, right? So one is a tactical argument that by withholding a couple percentage of the vote, uh, you know, that's the sort of vote we're talking about, votes from committed leftists. Uh, then uh, then we can exercise some sort of leverage of the Democratic Party. I don't think that strategy has worked before. The other question is, okay, maybe we don't have any leverage one way or the other, which I think is the unfortunate reality of it. Uh, the, the outcome of the election matters because the difference between Democratic and Republican appointees to the National Labor Relations Board matter. But uh, that doesn't. Uh, but in terms of in terms of pushing the Biden administration to the left, that's not going to be the Lincoln Project administration, not out. They're 100 percent right about that. But then your other argument was about integrity. You said we're giving up our integrity. That's not a tactical argument. That's a principled argument. And I guess I would question what the principle is there, because it seems to me that if you're in some scenario like you're in a horror movie and you know Jigsaw or somebody says. You have a choice between these two rooms that you can, you know, open up this door, this door, and something's going to try to kill you in, in each one. Uh, you could say, nope, I have integrity. I'm not going to choose. Or you could say, I want to open up the door where I think me and my friends have a better chance of surviving. And I think that that would be the right call here. Uh, and I think that would also be the right call when it comes to what the left should do in swing states. <laughs> so... I want to go. I want to address uh, this this idea that somehow allowing Biden to to become president is somehow going to shore up uh, labor unions or the labor force in general, and or even just preserve it. I don't want to put words in your mouth, so let's just say preserve it. Um, there's literally nothing, no findings that support that at all. You're talking about like a man who vehemently supports NAFTA, still supports it, did support TPP before it was broken up. Uh, has a history of just being union in name only. I mean, we can just look at one of these articles, this article from The Guardian, where he said, at no point in his career has Biden proven uh, will be, to be willing to take the slightest political risk on behalf of workers. His appearances in union halls occur when he needs something from labor. On the other hand, when Biden went to vacation in the Hamptons during 2011 Verizon strike, workers in the area sought him out to possibly get a show of support, a thumbs up, a head nod, anything to no avail. The same year in Wisconsin, labor leaders specifically asked Biden to come to a rally uh, uh, to re uh, excuse me uh, to rally their resistance to the brutal, ultimately uh, successful attack by Scott Walker, and Biden declined. In other words, Biden is not only reliable when it comes to preserving labor, uh, but he's actually abysmal on the issue. And the areas where he's had the power to do anything about it to help labor. He's done the opposite. As VP, he says the bailout, he takes a lot of credit for that bailout where he literally bailed out Wall Street instead of Main Street. He bailed out the auto industry, but did little to nothing to help bail out the auto workers. He's a lot of the reasons that a lot of these jobs are not here anymore. And like, let's not forget, this is also not just about Biden, of course. This is about Kamala because Biden has made it clear that the person who comes in as VP needs to be ready by day one because he has no anticipation of being a two-term president. And so now we have to worry about consequences, not only 
next year, but four, eight, 12 years down the line. So you're really giving up your leverage potentially for three administrations because if he, she starts day one after two years, she can run again twice. And this is a candidate who is, who was, excuse me, wildly unpopular. We already know what both of them have done to communities of color. We already know what both of them have done to black communities specifically. We already know, like, I understand what you're referring to about labor and like, that's a, that's a big deal. Like, don't get it twisted. I agree with you, but I, I'm also worried about like the life of myself and the people who look like me. And there is, in none, in none of your arguments, by the way, I've just heard zero reassurance about this key issue. And this is an issue that I've seen ignored by quote unquote socialists who care about quote unquote labor on a regular basis. I'm glad that we're worried about labor, but I'm also worried about deaths. And when you're talking about a man who said 300, we want to give 300 million more dollars to cops for better training without ever questioning whether or not they even want to be trained, without even bringing up the fact that Breonna Taylor, in that case, the attorney general lied and said that the jury agreed that the cops shouldn't be prosecuted. And it came out, a jury member came out in a New York Times story and said, that's a lie. We never even had the option to prosecute uh, those two officers. And Joe Biden has said nothing about it where he tries to purport this idea that Antifa is an idea, but not an organization, because he doesn't want people organized. Antifa is not an, it's not an idea. It is an organization where people didn't wear masks, and this originated with Mussolini, because I know there's a bunch of Black leaders who found, uh, 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 they, they were placed in the leadership of Antifa in Italy and in Germany. It's where the Black Fist comes from. What we should be doing, instead of giving up our leverage by using one candidate's name or another, is do like what Martin Luther King, Malcolm X, Human P, Huey P. Newton, the, uh, back in the day, Angela Davis, Fred, uh, Fred Hampton. All these great activists did something that the left seems to not be able to bring themselves to do anymore, which is maybe we should just tell everybody we're going to challenge them instead of telling the world who we are and aren't going to vote for before we've even gotten anything, any concessions whatsoever. And I think that that is the part that is kind of missing out of here is people don't really realize how we've had any success, the little bit of success the left has had in this country. How have we had any success in the past? How did the civil rights legislation get passed? Because Martin Luther King sat down with JFK, even though they disliked each other, because RFK related to MLK as an activist, of course, and then of course he was JFK's brother, and he forced them to sit down but that was after Martin Luther King had every bit of leverage he had. And still you wouldn't know who he was going to vote for if JFK ever got to run again. Like, you, you just never know. And that's, that's how the left, in, in its best organizing years, have gotten the most done. Yeah, so I want to go back to the very first thing you said uh, about Biden's terrible record on labor, all of which I agree with. But let's, let's be really clear about why I think this matters in terms of preserving uh, you know, what's uh, what's left of the labor movement. It's not because I think that Biden is going to do a 180 and stop supporting the kind of corporatist trade deals that he's always supported. I don't. Uh, it's not because I think that there's some great reform uh, that he's going to uh, he's going to start supporting. I don't. Again, I think that uh, I think that the idea that these things will happen either just because we're voting for him uh, or that these things will happen in some future democratic administration because we exercise this supposed leverage by not voting for him. I don't think there's a lot of historical evidence for either of those. I would point out with regard to uh, the Civil Rights Act uh, that uh, if JFK had stayed president, there, uh, there might very well not be the meaningful Civil Rights Act you know, that, uh, that actually happened uh, in 1964. Uh, that you know, because that was really pushed through uh, by Lyndon Johnson after an election, by the way, uh, where um, where Martin Luther King, who was the most successful of those leaders that you just mentioned, uh, strongly supported uh, Johnson uh, against Goldwater, uh, despite Johnson's uh, terrible previous record uh, on on civil rights. Uh, but the reason that I think that it matters as far as labor is this very specific issue, which is whether Democrats or Republicans are going to be appointed to the courts and to the National Labor Relations Board. And I think that Biden would do what Obama did, uh, which is to say, mostly appoint mediocre Democrats to those things rather than Republicans, which means having a whole bunch of precedents that were just reversed uh, by the Trump administration when it comes to stuff like whether the union is allowed to use public places, an employer like the area outside of a grocery store uh, that the Salvation Army might set up in uh, to, uh, to pass out information reversed uh, by, uh, by Trump's National Labor Relations Board, uh, who can file grievances, 
uh, you know, whether, and then that's not even getting in to the really scary stuff like the COVID era rulings uh, about how uh, exposing the terrifying working conditions, which by the way, disproportionately affect people of color, uh, you know, at, uh, at by, faced by essential workers, how that's not protected speech, uh, the use of COVID uh, as an excuse to cancel union elections. And I think that expecting Biden to be not a bit better than Obama, which is what I expect, it's still the case that under Obama, you had appointees to these things who did not rule in the kinds of extreme anti-union ways as Trump's appointees to these things because the Democratic Party's structural relation uh, to unions is different. It screws them over in many, many ways, no doubt about it, uh, but uh, it's part of the deal whereby it continues to be supported by them uh, is about not screwing them over uh, in this way. Now, could there be, um, how about that issue that you raised? And, and I think it's it's important and it's good, right? You know, that you raised this issue about militarized policing, about the mass incarceration state, uh, where of course Biden's record has been absolutely terrible. But the question on the table, at least as I see it, is not Biden good or Biden bad. If that was the question, we'd be on the same side and it'd be a very short debate. Uh, the question is, are there any areas in which it would be better for us if Trump one rather than Biden one. Uh, I certainly don't see any reason to think that mass incarceration and militarized policing would be one of those areas, uh, especially considering that we're talking about uh, the, you know, the president, uh, Trump, uh, who has done things like send department of the Department of Homeland Security to uh, anti-police brutality protests, uh, to uh, to shove protesters uh, into unmarked, uh, unmarked vans, who's done things like speak to groups of police officers to urge them to be less gentle. Uh, when, uh, when when arresting people, uh, who's done things like uh, like using the military to uh, to clear out crowds of anti police brutality protesters, so are there any areas like this in which it would be better if Trump won than Biden won? If not, uh, what we're left with are areas in which it would either be neutral, right, it, that it would be equally bad if Trump won or Biden won, or areas where it would not be quite as bad for us if Biden won than if, than if Trump won. Now, my contention is that there are lots of areas that you can find, I don't doubt this, where it would be pretty neutral. It would be about the same under Trump or Biden. But if it's also true that there are areas that are important to us uh, where it's uh, where if, if Trump is reelected, it's going to be significantly worse then if Biden is elected, I think that this, I think this, that this National Labor Relations Board one is one of them. It's not talked about nearly enough. It's absolutely strategically crucial for the future of the left. I think that the post office uh, and uh, and Trump's floating of plans to privatize the post office is, is very important. I think, by the way, uh, if if we want to talk about racial justice issues, which we should, I think that I think that the institution of the post office uh, and the institution of labor unions. Uh, have been among the major drivers of black upward mobility uh, in uh, in the 20th century, uh, and so I think that's important. But I also think, and this is the last point, I'll, I'll, I'll yeah, I was okay. I was just going to butt in right after this. Uh, so I also think that when we're talking about those people who have been most failed by the status quo, the people who have been most brutalized by the status quo, in other words, black and brown communities of color, right? The people who have been you know, at least domestically, at least in the United States. We can talk about foreign policy. I'm not convinced that there's any way in which a Trump victory would be preferable to a Biden victory there. But at least within the United States, those people and how we can do right by them, then I think the question can't be, uh, what's the best strategy for pressuring Biden? Because I think I think that's a non-starter, which I think we actually might agree on. I think the question has to be, how can we build something better? How can we build a successful left that can actually beat centrists in primaries and can win general elections and could ultimately win socialism? Uh, because that's what really matters as far as doing right by those people. And I think that when it comes to that, I do think that our strategy for that, what's strategically important for fulfilling that objective, does run through having an organized working class. So not just for the sake of day-to-day -day bread and butter issues in the workplace, but also for the sake of everything else that we care about as the left. If that is the most crucial way, at least strategically, we can also talk about harm reduction and technocratic okay, management of the COVID gonna, crisis. But, but if, if that's the most strategically vital way that there's a difference, then I think for the sake of all of the issues that you're talking about, 
we should preserve what we have by making a defensive vote in swing states. All okay, right, so wait, wait, okay, just one, one sec. Why don't, why don't I give, because we've already reached the 20 minutes here, why don't I give Nico like three or four minutes just to address all the points you brought up there, Ben, and then I'll give you maybe one minute, Ben, to, to you know, answer back, uh, at which point I want to open it up to the audience mm -hmm. questions. Then we'll go to so, q yeah. yeah? Okay, all right. Okay. So let's do that, right. Nico. Fair enough. So I want to uh, address this point where you say, well, at least uh, Biden will nominate mediocre Democrats. Um, and there's zero proof that that's actually like what he'll do. Not even like, like <laughs> in, in large numbers, but even in kind of medium numbers, like this is the same man who excoriated Anita Hill to protect Clarence Thomas. This is the same man who worked, who, who brags about, I'm the reason that the Patriot Act got introduced. I'm the one who designed the Patriot Act, which he worked with Brett Kavanaugh to basically learn how to legally undermine the constitution, quote unquote, to, to get passed and introduced. Like, the man bragged the entire primary out, work with Republicans, which seem to only be in situations where he screws the working class or specifically is screwing black people. Like the man has made it very clear, even as of a couple of days ago, he's not only willing to work with Republicans, but he's willing to work with the worst Republicans that we know. And it once again, it's not that he, not just that he's willing to do it, but that he would be willing to do it. And we know that it would go by in silence and the left, especially the neoliberal or the neoliberal, the neoprogressive left, whether it be in Congress or outside of it, will gaslight and just say, oh, well, the Republicans will be worse, except for basically Joe Biden is a Republican and has his it had it had a substantial history of working with those uh same Republicans. Now, there's also the reality that uh mediocre democrats are damn near just as bad as republicans we can look no further than ruth gator or ruth bader ginsburg who worked to make sure or who allowed um or put out a ruling i should say that resulted in indigenous people being displaced as a so a pipeline could be built through like worked to make sure that the police state could uh run license plates uh, in a case where specifically a black man was having his license plates run illegitimately, but because of her recent ruling before she passed away, now cops can run license plates with, without any reason whatsoever, which primarily affects people of color and specifically black people. Um, when we're talking about like what Joe Biden is, I, we, we, there seems to be this breakdown in communication about like the Democrat versus Republican thing. Like we just keep ignoring the fact that Joe Biden is literally Republican. It was not just several months ago where leftists swore on the damn the, the Bible of socialism that they would never even think about voting for Joe Biden because he was in fact the neoconservative Republican in Democratic skin. Like that's what he painted himself as. And he was bragging about this, like I said, a lot during the primary. So we can't really lose track of the fact that Joe Biden has shown no proof whatsoever that he would nominate uh, even decent Democrats, uh, let alone not nominating Republicans. Now, I want to go back to the USPS point just really quick. The USPS has been consistently under attack for, for literally multiple terms, right? Just like the Small Business Administration, every single term, every single administration has chipped away at the USPS. And the, the postmaster himself said that this didn't start with Trump and it's not even speeding up under Trump. It is just consistently getting worse, but there's more attention being brought to it because it's being directly linked to election fraud by Democrats. And the Democrats are looking for every reason to say that the election is going to be stolen from them, just like the Republicans want to harp on ballot harvesting as if they didn't just get found guilty of that in North Carolina and just got caught doing it in California. Both of them will use whatever tactics they have to, to ignore the history of them both equally participating in the denigration of democracy. Now, I also want to say that um, we got about a like lot 30 of, seconds. Yeah. So a lot of the policing issues that you brought up also happened under Obama. And of course, I know they happened under Trump, but we got to remember they a lot of them are have started because of Joe Biden. <laughs> like, I don't know why we keep pretending like this isn't a thing. Like, yeah, the things that happened under Obama and Trump have equally been horrid. But once again, you know about all of them now. Everybody's organizing once again because everybody likes hates the ugly fascism. But they and they prefer the civility fascism. But I remember everything that happened under Trump, or excuse me, under Obama, and I remember how most people never organized, whereas now the whole country is organizing to stop Trump. And then, of course, I do believe that there is something to be said that one president, one presidential candidate, literally said he basically wants to go to war with Russia and or China, whereas Trump 
has at least taken us out of Afghanistan and hasn't started any new wars, unlike the administration that Biden was in that started five new wars brought us, and brought us to seven. Okay, okay. Do, you think you, do you think you can keep this give, in give, a minute? Give a minute. All right, all right, yeah. I'm going to try like hell. All right. Uh, I never swore on the Bible of socialism that I wouldn't vote for a centrist if uh, if what won. In fact, you can go back and look at stuff that I was writing a year ago. I always said that I'd have this this position. This is my position. I uh, might be wrong, but at least it's consistent. Uh, so uh, the reason that we have to think that Biden would have mostly appoint mediocre Democrats to the National Labor Relations Board is that's what, uh, that's what Barack Obama did, and that's what Bill Clinton did. Everything that you're saying about Biden working with, uh, with Republicans uh, on, uh, on, on many things, you know, voting for bad Republicans, being willing to appoint Republicans to his cabinet, that's also true, just like it was also true about Bill Clinton, it was also true about Barack Obama, but they all appointed people to the National Labor Relations Board of the Courts who made very different rulings. It's not at all true that Ruth Bader Ginsburg was equivalent to a conservative Supreme Court justice. Uh, look at her, look at the position she took about Janice, look at the positions she took about reproductive rights, look at the uh, look at the positions that she's taken on a number of issues. You don't have to convince me that they're terrible, disgusting rulings that she made, but that's not the question. The question is, what's the difference and how does that difference matter to us strategically? And to be convinced that I was wrong about that, I would have to say I would have to be shown that there are no ways in which they're going to be different that are of strategic interest to us. And I certainly haven't heard that. OK, uh, first, thank you so much, both of you, to being so uh, responsible and professional during this. There's been uh, just one no yelling. Y'all, y'all are great. Uh, I've got a lot of questions from the audience, so I'm just going to start uh, directing them uh, either to both of you, uh, but some of them are very specifically towards each of you. If you could try and keep the answers under uh, a two minute mark. Um, I'll just maybe give you a warning if they're, if they're rolling higher than that. Um, so this uh, first one is to you, Nico. Uh, do you know that Tulsi Gabbard is supporting Joe Biden? And what do you think about that? Yeah, I was one of the first people she told. Uh, Joe, uh, Tulsi Gabbard signed a contract and said she was going to support Joe Biden. Um, I don't know if she knows for sure what plans she has going forward, but if she would have not honored that contract, then she may have been disallowed from running again for president, which I'm sure she probably will run twice because most people do. Um, and and then by the time she finished, you know, if by the time the court ruling was put up, they would be more than halfway through the primary. She'd have no chance to win. So I'm pretty sure that had a lot to do with her decision. As far as myself is concerned, I'm a Tulsi Gabbard surrogate, and I'm actually the only surrogate for any of the campaigns that was allowed to criticize and disagree openly with my candidate, despite popular belief. I was the only one allowed to do that. And so uh, she's fully aware of what my position is. She knew that actually before I became one of, became one of her surrogates. And uh, that's one of the reasons that I had so much respect for her is because even in our disagreements, we coalesce on the issues, no matter what, like election integrity, like the all fossil fuels actually introduced, uh, and foreign policy, of course. So, uh, yeah, there you go. Uh, to Mr. Ben Burgess, um, how can you support someone like Joe Biden when a lot of the things that he put in place, including the 1994 crime bill, are what contributed to the current state of the uh, the uh, the United States uh, that we find ourselves in today that is directly related to the reason that Donald Trump got elected in the first place? Well, I totally agree with the assessment of Biden's background, and I totally agree that the uh, that the evils of that kind of neoliberal democratic centrism are a big part of how we got Trump in the first place, which is why I absolutely don't think that making that tactical defensive decision that I'm advocating is any sort of solution to that problem. You're right. At best, it just resets us uh, where uh, where we where we started, and if we don't build something better, uh, then we're going to end up in the same place again, you know, with 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 Tom Cotton as uh, as president uh, or uh, or something like that, right? They they can always come up with even worse, even scarier, uh, re- you know, Republicans. So I don't think that it's to me it's it's not about uh, supporting Biden in the sense of of liking him, of thinking, oh, I'm gonna I'm gonna give him the honor of my vote. The question is the equivalent of, do I want somebody to run after me waving a knife or do I want somebody to run after me shooting a gun? Yeah, I know about the knife, uh, but I would still prefer the knife scenario uh, to, uh, to, to the gun scenario. And ultimately what it does is it gives us a little bit of breathing room with which we can build something better. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, to Nico, uh, say in your scenario, Trump wins, then what? Well, my scenario, I would do the same thing I'm doing now. I'm an election integrity advocate. This is something that I do on the ground. I'm an activist uh, on the ground. Uh, my team that I, that I built is 
right now to this. I mean, I think they just went to a protest last night and they're going to another one and they cover what happens with police brutality in real time. They've been arrested just a, a couple of weeks ago. Um, also, we're in the process of creating a, a master class, virtual online class for, to start worker owned co-ops. We're going to try to be the first media network that is worker owned uh, completely. And we want to teach other people how to build a progressive economy uh, through worker owned co-ops because as we've seen some of the really some of the most successful businesses uh, and profitable, to be honest, have been like legitimately profitable, not like fake profits like stock market, but um, they have been worker owned co-ops. And so once again, this is, a, and of course, I just, you know, do what I do as far as the news is concerned, but uh, this is not a fight for me that started or stopped with the election. Uh, I was an activist before I got into media. I was an activist while I was at UNC, and uh, I was an organizer and activist after that. And that's not going to stop anytime soon. Uh, but the difference is, once again, it's a lot easier to organize and activate against Trump because everybody knows how bad he is. But once again, under, uh, under Biden, as just as we saw on Twitter, uh, criticism of Biden or his son or his family or his corrupt dealings will not be tolerated. And in fact, in situations like with Twitter, they'll lie. I'm a big foreign policy advocate. I pay a lot of attention to foreign policy. And they, Twitter lied and said that he never fired the prosecutor for investigating his son, except for he bragged about it uh, at a CFR meeting that he in fact did brag about, uh, or excuse me, that he in fact did fire the prosecutor for investigating his son. And he did threaten to withhold $1 billion. And I would love to be able to criticize things like that and organize against things like that with people like Code Pink uh, and, and others to make sure that not only can Trump not get away with things like this again, but neither can anyone who gets elected in the future. Can I uh, jump in for 30 seconds on part of what he just said? Sure. As long as it's 30 seconds, I'll, I'll time it. Okay. Yeah. I think this idea that you can organize against uh, Trump in a way that you can't organize uh, against a centrist Democrat, I think it doesn't bear out historically. Black Lives Matter started under Obama. Occupy Wall Street started under Obama. Bernie Sanders won 22 states while Obama was president. If anything, I think oftentimes the opposite happens, which is that with a flashy, ostentatiously evil Republican like Donald Trump or George W. Bush, a lot of distant anti-establishment energy gets focused on them as an individual and people being opposed to them as an individual. Uh, whereas with a figure uh, like Obama or Biden as, uh, as president, oftentimes that energy gets channeled against the system because it's less easy to blame it on the individual at the top of that system. Okay. Do you want, do you want like a minute to respond to that? Yeah. 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 So, uh, Black Lives Matter got co-opted into a 501c4 organization that is now fundraising millions of dollars for Joe Biden's campaign. The very man who called, who created the 94 crime bill and really is a lot of the reasons why we have BLM to begin with. Uh, Occupy was utterly destroyed by Obama and they went away damn near silently into the night because nobody wants to challenge Obama as an individual. There's this false dichotomy that we have to have uh, or that we can, oh, it's we can organize, but you know, and it's easier to organize because they can't blame it on a person or we can hold that person accountable so I'm simultaneously organizing and make sure that when we do have to call out that person, like what he did with in Flint, where he fake drank water, or what he allowed to happen in Standing Rock, or what he allowed to happen in Baltimore Ferguson, like we want to make sure that those criticisms are heard by even by, of course, his own party, where which by which you just said it's easier to do it to Trump, where he, that he can be held accountable. But now we see organizing efforts against, for example, the kids being put in cages, which we had never seen under Obama. And once again, by the way, Biden is still defending this. But that's just one example of the many examples of how organizing, we can organize and, and, and fight, but also we need the ability to hold the people to account that should be held to okay, account right without being silenced for it. Um, this next question is going to kind of be related to that, Ben. So it might be a way if you want to keep talking about this mm -hmm. topic. But one of the questions towards you is that, yes, uh, Black Lives Matter started under Obama. But at that time, it was heavily suppressed and seen as a negative uh, movement, whereas now it is seen as something that is universally accepted. Uh, do you think that was possible uh, under the Biden or sorry, under the Obama administration versus what it has become under Trump's? Okay, so first of all, the idea that the uh, that that BLM, which sure sometimes refers to this very specific thing, this nonprofit, uh, sometimes uh, it refers to this very broad movement against uh, police violence. Um, but uh, the idea that that in any version of it that's met universal acceptance right now, I don't think is quite living in the real world. I think if you look at the polls, uh, actually since the summer, uh, support has unfortunately really dropped off. 
Um, and, uh, and I think that it's not, um, and I mean, look, there was a point when, uh, when Trump and Cotton were talking about sending in the military, there were polls where over 50% of the public uh, supported that, unfortunately, right? On this issue, we have our work cut out for us. Uh, so so I, I think this idea that like, oh, sure, it existed then, but everybody supports it now, I think, I think is really wrong. And of course, what, you know, the questioner says, what Nico said about how a lot of these movements were either uh, politically co-opted or they were crushed by police repression or some combination of the two. All of that, of course, is true, but I don't really think that's relevant to the main point, which is that if you're going to argue that uh, there's going to be less opposition, fewer openings for the left uh, under a centrist Democrat than there will be under a right-wing Republican, then the fact that these movements got started at all under Obama, that that's when they happened, I think really undermines that claim. I think it's, I think it's really evidence against it. I think actually the left is generally better off. I mean, not that I would put too much weight on this. I think that, I think that if we're primarily thinking about, I don't think we should primarily think about, okay, um, you know, are we going to have slightly more political openings under this one and under this one? How's this group of people going to think about this president or that president? I think we should keep our eye on the ball okay, and think about minutes, those NL, NL, NLRB rulings. But I was just going to say, I think that I think that there is actually a lot of evidence that under under bad Democrats going from SDS in the Johnson administration uh, to occupying the Bernie movement under Obama, uh, very often that's actually the most favorable terrain for the left because instead of everything getting clumped together to oppose this right wing Republican, there's more room for differentiation between liberals and the left. Um, I take a sec. Yeah, 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 yeah. Of course, of course, please. Okay, so um, he had a really bad Democrat in Bill Clinton who, by the way, ran on being right to the right of George H.W. on crime, but we had a really bad Democrat. Mm. The next guy, uh, I think we remember how that turned out, millions of Iraqis and Afghanis dead now. Um, and then, of course, we got Obama, who ran on being real. Actually, I, people don't give Obama enough credit for how deceitful he was during that campaign. Um, but you are right about one thing. It was organizing under Obama because people started getting more and more and more pissed. Um, and then, but they were once again not really allowed. There was Obama was very rarely put in a position where he had to face those criticisms and take that challenge. And in fact, a lot of times he used it as an opportunity to co-opt it. And then, like for example, use the CFPB as a, a Trojan horse to help implement Dodd Frank, which made the banks even bigger. Uh, of course, we know that he also used it like with uh, Occupy Wall Street it was really birthed out of bailing out Wall Street instead of quote unquote Main Street. And then because of how bad he was, I know we talk about the Bernie movement, but then look what happened. We got Donald goddamn Trump right after that. Um, and then of course, because we didn't want to talk about election fraud or address what happened to Bernie Sanders and he, Bernie Sanders himself didn't want to address what happened to it. Now we're back at, we're back in a situation where we have somebody who's potentially, uh, you know, I don't, I don't know if you consider him worse than Bill Clinton, but He's at the very bare minimum, way more willing to work with Republicans than Bill Clinton was. And, and then you have, of course, the Kamala Harris factor where Republicans, I think they hate Kamala more than they hate Biden. And you have to deal with the fact that with that Bernie movement, there was a huge splintering of that movement where a lot of those Bernie supporters went right to Trump because they felt like they were being unaddressed. They felt like they were being unheard. Like, that's two reality. Minutes. And so where we can't, like we got Trump right now. So we get Biden, who is arguably worse than Bill Clinton. And he's definitely worse than Obama, I would say. Like, who do we get next, bro? Like, who are we going to get if Biden is allowed to get away with or Kamala eventually is allowed to get away with some of the things that these other neoliberal presidents were able to get away with? I don't want to know that. I would rather, once again, I'd rather we have a conversation in the future, Ben, about how we organize this labor movement, how we make sure we don't get candidates like Biden and Trump against each other again, and how we expand these parties to make these elections more and more conclusive. OK, um, just very quickly, Nico, because this is one of the last questions, and then I was going to move on pretty shortly to your closing statements. But this question to you, Nico, is uh, yes, but is Joe Biden worse than Donald Trump? Uh, is Joe Biden worse than Donald Trump? Uh, like I said, people ask me that all the time, and I just consider one a neo-fascist and one a civility fascist. It's just that one I'm allowed to criticize and one I might get banned 
banned from uh from Twitter, or Facebook, or YouTube, or whatever from criticizing. One, uh, if I criticize, I become a famous neo progressive. The other, uh, you you might end up like Chris Pratt and be called a white supremacist if you don't show up at his fundraiser. Uh, one has the tech industry protecting him. The other one has the tech industry literally uh, what are they adding context to Twitter trends in order to uh, basically commit a narrative siege. That's what exactly what it looks like if you've been reading them. And and for me, I would rather you know have the person in power that I can actually fight without getting uh, you know just dragged to the ground for doing and having my career ended. Um, like which which you're seeing right now with with Chris Pratt, despite the fact that Robert Downey Jr. also didn't go to that fundraise, which is a different discussion. But um, I don't think it's a matter of like what Ben said. I, I think we both agree it's not a matter of who's worth worse but more so a matter of who we can fight and it seems pretty clear to me who we actually are allowed to fight uh and that would be donald trump um all right do you guys want to give your closing statements uh i'll start with you ben five minutes sure so the argument that uh, that i made in the beginning um was that even though both of these people are our enemies it matters uh, strategically even beyond harm reduction uh, and issues like technocratic management of the COVID crisis, uh, it matters strategically uh, which one of these enemies that we fight for the next four years and about which issues. Uh, my main argument from the beginning has been that if you compare Obama's appointees, the National Labor Relations Board and the courts, to Trump's appointees, the National Labor Relations Board and the, the courts, if you look at all the Obama-era precedents that Trump's NLRB reversed, always to make things harder for workers and easier for bosses, all right, uh, the then there judge. does seem to be a fairly significant difference there. Uh, and what I, I want you to keep your eye on is that nothing that we've heard, right? I've heard a lot from Nico about the importance of election integrity, which I agree with. I've heard a lot from Nico about uh, the importance of worker co-ops, which I really agree with, you know, and 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 you should go support what he's talking about there. Uh, you, I've uh, I've heard a lot from Nico about all of the many many terrible things that Biden is doing. Which, if I were debating a centrist about uh, about whether uh, you know Biden good, Biden bad, I'd probably bring up most of the uh, most of the same things. Uh, but if we're concerned about our ability to fight, I think what matters is not. Um, how is Twitter going to react? How uh, how are you know neoliberals and neoconservatives, uh, you know what what their takes are going to be like about the piddling nonsensical tempest in a teapot about the Chris Pratt thing? I don't care about any of those people. Uh, the what we should care about are institutional things like. Uh, is uh, you know is the Department of Homeland Security uh, going to be sent to uh, to, pro to to Portland to shove protesters in an unmarked van? And in particular, as socialists, what we should care about is our ability to build a workers' movement that can fight for something better. And what I have not heard from Nico at any point is any reason to think that Biden wouldn't do with regard to the National Labor Relations Board of the Courts what Obama did, and what for that matter Bill Clinton did. Bill Clinton. Uh, was I think maybe a little worse than Nico's remembering. Uh, he uh, he he did. Uh, well, I was only like three or four years old, so forgive me a bit. Okay, okay, okay. That's that's fair <laughs> enough. I, I, I am very old, uh, so uh, so so maybe those disgusting memories are uh, slightly fresher because at least I was a teenager. But uh, uh, but uh, but Bill Clinton appointed William Cohen, a Republican, as his as his Secretary of Defense. Uh, but. Uh, Clinton basically appointed Democrats to the NLRB. Uh, Obama basically, for the most part, appointed Democrats to the NLRB. And I think that I haven't heard anything that resembles a reason to think that Biden wouldn't do the same thing. Whereas we know that Trump is going to appoint to the NLRB and the courts people who whose mission in life, what makes them get up in the morning, what motivates them throughout the day is to stamp out what's left of the labor movement and what's left of collective bargaining in American workplaces. If we care not about pressuring one or the other of our enemies to be a little bit better, if we care not about uh, about how people will react uh, on Twitter or in editorial pages to what we're doing, hey, if we're succeeding, those people are going to hate us no matter who's president. Uh, what we should care about is our ability to organize the working class, to build a better alternative and bring about something better. And from that perspective, this NLRB thing, it's not sexy, but it does matter. And so the one thing that we actually can control, looking at the, all the states in the past 
where there have been third party uh, vote counts that have been higher than the difference between the Democrats and Republicans. The one thing we can control is who's elected and hence who's going to be appointed to these things and hence what our chances are of maintaining some kind of workers movement that can fight to, to live another day. And I think from that perspective, it's clear which enemy we should pick in a couple of weeks when we vote. Um, so, uh, well, first I want to say, Ben, I do, I sincerely appreciate the debate. It was a fantastic conversation. Once again, one of Same my too. favorite debates and debating you has been one of my favorite, uh, like I've debated a lot of, a lot of leftists. You've been the most coherent and definitely have been uh, the most professional and polite. So I appreciate that. Um, and, uh, so I do want to say that this, this idea somehow so that, that, I that, in the, Canada to have that more than consent, two options to vote the manufacturing of that consent is all of a sudden just uh not important does it make any sense as we're of course in an era right now where the where the neoliberals love to prop up um uh oh man i forgot chomsky excuse me they love to prop up chomsky every four years to get him to manufacture consent ironically enough but chomsky and his his co-author wrote about manufacturing consent for a reason what the what the big tech industries are doing are literally manufacturing consent uh and they have the institutional power and clearly the you know the the the, the institutions our governmental institutions are allowing them to do it um to one degree or another and we can't really do anything about that like so I, it's it's weird that, like this caught, being codified as oh it's just a bunch of banter on twitter it's, it doesn't just limit it's not limited to twitter if it was just a bunch of banter on twitter i, I doubt we would be as invested in twitter in these publications in news articles in facebook 50 percent of article what 50 percent of all articles are read on facebook now like it matters there's a reason that millions in campaign funds are paid to promote candidates or causes or institutions on Twitter. That's why the Lincoln Project is so invested in Twitter. That's why Kamala always dancing for Twitter. That's why Twitter blocked the article about Hunter Biden to begin with, because they aren't, it isn't just Twitter. It's, we know we can control the narrative. And that narrative is what leads to fundraising for the causes that we support. That narrative is what leads to uh, the, the leaders, who the leadership that comes out of these of these social media apparatuses because but for the causes that we support and and i don't think I, I can't accept this idea where we should pretend as if twitter is just twitter and it doesn't matter or facebook is just facebook it just doesn't matter like yeah it's not real life but real, people in real life spend a lot of money to control the narrative on these platforms and they should be taken seriously whenever we see how neoliberals have taken these platforms and basically use them as bastions for their brand to then uh co-opt and convert over into votes or fundraising for one party one or, or another or one candidate or another um as far as what trump has done and what biden might do and what obama has done um i do think it should be clarified obama definitely allowed the national guard to be sent to ferguson that happened uh he he told the governor to be wary but that definitely happened and if he even if he didn't he definitely militarized them and they're literal tanks in ferguson like i said the, co uh, the 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 police department in North Dakota took people's eyes, took people's arms, despite the massive organizing effort there. Um, by the way, that was killed by Obama. Surprisingly enough, was the 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 negatives that all came about because of that. We thought it was over and done with. The courts actually sided with the Sioux Nation, and that pipeline, the North Dakota Access Pipeline, is no lot was not allowed. Is not allowed to be there now. And that happened under Trump, which is weird. I'm not giving, not equating the two. But what I'm saying is, sometimes it's better to fight. It's better to spend our energy, and our rhetoric, and our and our talents fighting and organizing for causes rather than pretending as if either of them are, you know, Trump or Biden are on our side. Like I'm voting for Gloria Lariva not because I think she has a chance to win, but because that is the person I want to work with when this is all said and done. Um, because she's, you know, an organizer. I'm sure you're familiar with her already. Um, I want to elevate conversations that actually drive the country forward rather than driving or uh, elevating the conversations that keep the country stagnant. Um, and that's what I feel like this is really a debate about. It's how do we spend our energy? Do we spend it on energy breaking? We spend our energy on Twitch breaking records to support 
Joe Biden? Or do we take those 400,000 uh, users and organize a massive effort in election integrity that allow the Bolivian indigenous to commit a coup of a coup? That's what election integrity, that, that one issue allowed, now let's not pretend like they're just going to disappear, but that one issue allow Evo Morales to rest is that, you know what, don't worry about it. I know what the outcome is going to be because we worked so hard on this one issue. Uh, Maduro worked so hard on this one issue. Several countries, several socialist nations worked so hard on this one issue that they're confident that they can minutes. overthrow coups through elections. This is the type of stuff that we should be organizing around rather than pretending as if uh, our, our the status quo is even something to think about like maintaining it should we should we should, people are dying under the maintenance of the status quo we should be aggressively pushing towards organization behind issues and that should be it i'm not saying that you can't support candidates but like i said the next time ben i hope that we have a discussion like this i truly do hope that it is in favor of issues in the best way to organize for those issues rather than figuring out the next the next lesser of two evils uh that we should elect Gentlemen, thank you so much. Uh, I want to thank you both formally for being so uh, respectful, polite, kind. I know it's not the kind of debates the internet craves, but it's the one they deserve. Or maybe it's the opposite. Maybe they don't deserve it. They deserve something terrible. But anyways, <laughs> hey, thank you guys both so much. I appreciate that. Uh, do you want to both shout out your socials? Uh, go ahead, man. Uh, sure. So you can follow me on Twitter, uh, twitter.com slash Ben Burgess. If you like that segment of Mikasa Sukasa, don't forget to like the video and smash that subscribe button. Want access to members only live streams, behind the scenes footage, and other premium content? Well, you can endorse us on Rockfin Premium, become a patron through Patreon, or you can sign up for the MCSC Premium membership through YouTube. All the links are in the description below. But hey, more than anything else, more than anything else, more than anything else, more than anything else, always remember, Find your balance. 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 Always remember, more than anything else, find your balance. Peace.